pray. O God, from whom all good things do come, grant to us, thy humble servants, that by thy holy inspiration we may think those things that be right, and by thy merciful guiding may perform the same. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. All right, turn in your Book of Concord to page 278. After a long, long, meandering journey through the article on repentance, we now come to a bunch of shorter articles uh, that will take us to the end of the uh, small cold, the small cold articles. We are on page 278, the article number four, the gospel. Note, Luther details how the gospel comes to us through the preached word of forgiveness. God lavishly and generously gives his gifts, providing the gospel in other forms as well, including holy baptism, the Lord's Supper, and the gospel shared among Christians who console and comfort one another with the word of Christ. Through each of these means, God grants forgiveness, life, and salvation. So that's the, the little note. And now let's read what Martin Luther actually says. He says, we will now return to the gospel which does not give us counsel and aid against sin in only one way. God is superabundantly generous in his grace. First, through the spoken word by which the forgiveness of sins is preached in the whole world. This is the particular office of the gospel. Second, through baptism. Third, through the holy sacrament of the altar. Fourth, through the power of the keys. Also, through the mutual conversation and consolation of brethren. For wherever two or three are gathered and other such verses. All right, so that's what Luther said. So what's, what's the point that he's making here? He's saying that the gospel is our treasure. The gospel that we, we who deserve to be punished eternally, nevertheless have God's forgiveness, life, and salvation lavished upon us, which we don't deserve, purely for the sake of God's love in Christ and not because of anything we've done to deserve it. This is the gospel. But what Luther is talking about here is that the gospel, which is our treasure, it's our counsel and our aid against sin. The gospel doesn't only come to us in one way. Very often you hear people say, well, if I, if I read my Bible, and believe that my sins are forgiven, why do I have to take Holy Communion? Why do I have to come to church? Why do I have to? And that's the, that have to thing is the problem. Because what those kinds of people who ask those kinds of questions are doing is, is that they're trying to stack up for themselves how much is enough? All right. How much do I really need? In other words, the implication is I want to get as much as I can with the least amount of effort. All right. And that's a danger sign. That's a danger sign. The, the, the point of the gospel is because the gospel is something we do not deserve. And because the gospel is something that gives us something that we have a hard time even fathoming the depth of God's grace in forgiving our sins, God gives it to us in numerous ways. So it says here, 
God is super abundantly generous in his grace. First, through the spoken word. So we are gathered here right now and we are studying the truth of Christian doctrine. This is the word of God. And therefore, we are being assured of God's grace and strengthened in our faith by the spoken word of teaching and preaching. The same thing happens whenever you're sitting at home with your Bible and you read your Bible. God, the Holy Spirit, is working through the words that are going through your eyes into your head. All right? It is the external word through which the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit doesn't come through your emotional exercises. The Holy Spirit attaches himself and comes by means of the words that are coming out of the preacher's mouth, the words that are emanating from the page of Scripture, the words that are, that are being shared in any way that they're shared, these words are the vehicle by which the Holy Spirit gets to you and gets in you and blesses you. So he says, so first through the spoken word by which forgiveness is preached in the whole world, and this is the particular office of the gospel, all the other ones derive from this. So the, the word of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, is the chief means of grace. Then second, through baptism. Third, through Holy Communion. And fourth, through the power of the keys. So we have Holy Communion, we have Holy Baptism, and we have confession and absolution. That's what the power of the keys is. It is the binding and loosing of sins. So through these four things, we have God doing the same thing to us over and over again. It's not a matter of how much do I have to. It's a matter of what you get to enjoy. Do you see the difference? You know, that whole idea, well, if I already believe that my sins are forgiven through hearing, reading my Bible, why do I have to do this, this, and this? Can I just do this? That's the wrong attitude, all right? The wrong attitude is, oh, I get to enjoy the grace of God in a multifaceted way. He's blessing me through the hymns that we sing. He's blessing me through the, the body and blood of Christ that I eat and drink in the sacrament. He's blessing me when he reminds me of the grace given to me in holy baptism. And he blesses me when I'm sitting home reading the Bible or reading a theologian or when I'm in church listening to the pastor. He's blessing me and I get to be part of this banquet of God's grace. You see, that's the point that Luther is driving home here. Now, so he, he talks about the, the word, baptism, sacrament, and absolution. Then he adds this, through the mutual conversation and consolation of brethren. What does that mean? That means when ordinary Christians get together and they comfort one another and encourage one another in the Christian faith. And they share scripture with one another uh, and they pray for one another. I, I remember back in the first couple of years that I was the pastor of this church, there were these two very elderly ladies. And, and every Monday morning, they would, they would get together on the telephone and they would, each one of them would take notes and they would... Uh, and, and they would listen very carefully and remember details of what I said in my sermon. And then they would talk to one another on the phone and they would encourage one another by the things that they remembered that I said. 
And then they would, when I'd go to visit them, they would tell me about all the things that I had said, and they remembered it better than I did. But the idea, you have these two little old ladies, and they were taking comfort in and sharing with one another what they had learned and heard uh, in church. And so this is the mutual conversation and consolation of brethren when Christians encourage one another in God's word. Right? And that also is because it's God's word that's in use. The Holy Spirit works through that kind of stuff. So that's the gospel. Article 5, baptism. Uh, and, uh, well, let's just go right to what Luther says. Baptism is nothing other than God's word in the water commanded by his institution. So, baptism is the water in, in which is the word of God. Now, I had a Baptist friend of mine one time said, what do you people do, you Lutherans? Do you put a Bible in the water? You know, because we talk, we talk about God's word in the water. No. When, when the Lord Jesus instituted the sacrament of baptism, he attached certain promises and commands of God to the use of the water in the sacrament. So the water of holy baptism is water used in connection with the words and institution of Christ. And so when you use the water, you're using it according to God's commandment and you are using it according to God's promise. And therefore the promise and the commandment they are in the water of baptism, all right? And that's the chief thing. The word of God makes baptism a baptism. It's not magic water. It's not holy water. It's regular water that we use, but when it is used in holy baptism, the word of God sanctifies the water and therefore the water becomes a washing of regeneration, right? So, baptism is nothing other than God's word in the water commanded by his institution. As St. Paul says, it is a washing with the word. As Augustine says, when the word is joined to the element or natural substance, it becomes a sacrament. This is why we do not agree with Thomas Aquinas and the monastic preachers who forget the word. They say that God has imparted to the water a spiritual power which through the water washes away sin. All right, so Thomas Aquinas and, and, and some of his followers, they said that God imparts to the water a certain spiritual power. In other words, God, through the priest, makes magic holy water, all right? And only that holy water can be used for baptism. Well, John the Baptist, he was the greatest baptizer that ever lived, he baptized people in the Jordan River, all right? The Jordan River. It wasn't holy water, all right? We call the land of Israel the Holy Land, but we only call it the Holy Land because holy things happened in it, not because there's something holy about the Holy Land. All right, so, so, so in the Catholic Church, there's an understanding that a spiritual power has been imparted to the water. No, what happens is God's word is the power of God unto salvation. That word is connected in holy baptism, is connected with the water. That's what makes the water a baptism. It's the word connected to the, 
And the word is both a command, go ye therefore and baptize, a commandment, and a promise. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's a promise, right? So these words are connected to the water that we use in the holy baptism, and those words are what makes the baptism a washing of regeneration, of new birth, because God's word is being applied to us by means of the water. All right, there you go. All right, so he says, nor do we agree with Scotus and the barefooted monks who teach that baptism washes away sins by the assistance of the divine will. They believe that this washing occurs only through God's will and not at all through the word or the water, right? See, that what the devil wants to always do is he wants to deflect your attention away from the core thing by putting a substitute in its place, all right? So in one sense, uh, through, through St. Thomas and others, he wanted to take your, your attention off the word of command and promise and put it on the water itself as if the water had some kind of spiritual quality to it, right? It's the word that's connected to the water. That's what gives the water its significance. So it, it, the word of God is the chief means of grace. Baptism is also a means of grace because the water is connected to the word. Right? That's the point. So the devil is always trying to do that. He's trying to make it seem like you're still paying attention to the right things. This is what we've been reading about, all about the papacy and all about the false repentance of the papacy that we've been reading for the past number of weeks. The whole thing is to make it look like you're doing the right thing, but to have your attention subtly redirected so you're not paying attention to the thing that's really key. All right? you're, you, have, you have put a substitute in the place where the key thing ought to be. And when you do, whenever you do that, in any realm of life, you're missing the point. And that's the point. The devil wants you to miss the point of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he will send lots of counterfeit uh, apostles into your life. And he will get you mad at things you should never be mad at. And he will make you pay attention to things that you should dismiss and push out of your consciousness. He will do what he can to make Jesus and his word go over into a corner and hide while you are paying attention to something that is penultimate, that is less than primary. All right. Of the baptism of children, we hold, uh, now I love this because Luther basically simply says the truth and dismisses the whole question, right? He says, of the baptism of children, we hold that children should be baptized. Why? For they belong to the promised redemption made through Christ. Therefore, the church should administer baptism to them. It's so beautifully simple. He says what? He says, listen, what did Jesus say? He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. So, are children included in the command to teach and baptize all nations? Yes. Are children sinners who need to be saved? Yes. Is the gospel also for children? Yes. And therefore, all kinds of sophistical kinds of arguments about reaching the age of accountability, you know, it's all nonsense because little children are born in sin and need to be saved. There's no other way to save little children than to baptize them. All right? And so baptism, so Luther just dismisses the fanatical understanding 
of, of the Anabaptists of his day by saying, listen, children should be baptized because they belong to the promised redemption made through Christ. Jesus died for them. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven, and therefore we should baptize children. All right? Now, when you're talking to someone who is an opponent of the baptism of children, you can get into more details, but for yourself and your own comfort, it is very comforting to know that little children who are sinners they are included in the word all nations. Or as St. Saint Mark says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Are little children creatures? Yes, preach the gospel to little children, boom. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, boom. You see, comforting. This is comforting and assuring. All right, sacrament of the altar. In the most vivid and realistic language about the Lord's Supper found in the Book of Concord, Luther asserts that the bread and the wine are the body and blood of Christ. They are present, distributed, and received by all who commune. Both bread and wine are to be given to communicants. The theory of transubstantiation is rejected as deceptive reasoning. The plain sense of Scripture is all that matters here because it is the word and promise of Christ. So that's the, the, uh, the note. Now, what Luther says. Of the sacrament of the altar, we hold that the bread and wine in the supper are Christ's true body and blood. There we go. All right. So he says it plain right at the top. The bread and wine in the supper are Christ's true body and blood. These are given and received not only by the godly, but also by wicked Christians. So the sacrament's efficacy, the, 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 the the fact that the sacrament does what the sacrament is instituted to do does not depend on whether the pastor who is administering to it is a spiritual person, nor does it depend for its efficacy on whether the people who receive it are spiritual. The sacrament is the body and blood of Christ, irrespective of that. Now, of course, the pastor is supposed to be faithful and believing, and the people are supposed to be faithful and believing, and that's how you benefit from the sacrament when you use it faithfully and rightfully. All right? But what Luther is saying here is, what makes it the body and blood of Christ? the institution of Christ, all right? It is objectively the body and blood of Christ. It doesn't depend on my piety or your piety. It depends on the word and promise of God. That's what makes the sacrament a sacrament. Now, that's what Luther is saying. It is, the bread is the body of Christ, the wine is the blood of Christ in the sacrament because that's what God's word says. And it is this, no matter what kind of piety you and I are having on any particular day. All right. He goes on and he says, we do not hold that only one kind of the sacrament is to be given. All right. So it was the common practice in the Roman Catholic Church that the lay people only were allowed to eat the bread, the body of Christ. And they were not allowed to drink the cup, the, the, to drink the blood of Christ. They were only allowed to eat the body of Christ in the sacrament. They call that one kind. All right? We do not hold that only one kind of the sacrament is to be given, i.e. The, the bread alone. We do not need that 
high reasoning, he's being sarcastic, that teaches that there is as much under the one kind as under both, as the sophists and the council of Constance teach. Uh, I'm going to explain this in a minute. Even if that were true, giving only one kind is not the entire ordinance and institution commanded by Christ. All right, what's, what's Luther saying? All right, the Roman Catholic theologians developed this idea called concomitance. And they say, basically it's like this. When you eat the body of Christ in the sacrament, bodies have blood in them, so you're actually, by just eating the bread, you're also indirectly eating the wine as well, that you're eating the blood as well. So you don't need to actually drink from the cup because you're getting both in the, in, in, in the one, all right? So you just need the bread because you're getting both in the bread. That's a, that's a philosophical, not a scriptural, but a philosophical rationalization for inventing a methodology that is contrary to the Bible, all right? And so Luther, Luther dismisses it by saying, even if that were true, that's Luther's way of saying it's not true, all right? But even if it were, giving the one kind only is not the entire ordinance and institution commanded by Christ. Even if you could reason with this philosophical idea of concomitance that you get the, the blood with the body in the bread, even if that were true, it's still contrary to the institution of Christ. Because every time we take communion, what is it that the words of institution say about the wine? Drink ye all of it. That means all of you drink from this. So if you abstain from the wine, you are disobeying the commandment of Jesus, whom you claim is your God and your Lord. You see this? You see how subtle it is? Jesus, Jesus commands us to drink from the cup. So if we, if we, for whatever reason, abstain from drinking the cup and think that we can only We'll just take the bread, what we, won't, we won't drink the cup, and everything will be fine. No, it's not fine. Why? Because you're violating the institution of Christ. Christ didn't institute uh, the sacrament of the altar so that you could pass by the cup of wine with a no thank you. All right? He instituted for you to eat and to drink and both the word eat and the word drink are in the imperative. They are orders. They are not suggestions. All right? That's important for you to remember. So Luther basically dismisses the Roman Catholic idea of concomitance. And he says, even if that sophistical nonsense were true, it's still against the institution of Christ as found in Scripture. He goes, we especially condemn and in God's name curse those who not only refuse to give both kinds, but also quite tyrannically prohibit, condemn, and blaspheme giving both kinds as heresy. So here he's, he's, he's uh, pounding away at the Pope, all right, uh, who, has, who has tyrannically withheld the cup from the laity. And by the way, the fact, the fact that the, the modern Roman Catholic Church in some circumstances now allows the lay people to drink from the cup, the fact that that now happens is proof that we won. All right? We won. 
In doing so, they exalt themselves against and above Christ, our Lord and God. As for transubstantiation, here's another uh, doctrine of philosophy, right? One of the things that the medieval doctors, the scholastics, we've talked about these people, these scholastic doctors, Thomas Aquinas and all those guys, uh, they love to come up with philosophical explanations for something that the Bible doesn't bother explaining. You don't need to know how it happens. You just need to know that it does happen. Right? If God were to show up and explain it to you in detail, your ears would melt off the side of your head. All right? Because it's way beyond your ability to understand. So, he says, as for transubstantiation. Now, let me explain transubstantiation so that you know what this is. All right, so, trans means to change, and substantiation means the substance of a thing. All right? So, in other words, the substance of a thing undergoes a change. That's transubstantiation. The substance of a thing undergoes a change. Right. Now, what does that have to do with Holy Communion? Well, Jesus took bread and he said, this is my body. So in the, in the doctrine of transubstantiation, what the Roman Catholic Church teaches is that when the priest says the words of institution, the bread stops being bread. It becomes the body of Christ. It still looks like bread. It still feels like bread. And it still tastes like bread. But it's not bread anymore. It is the body of Christ. Its substance has changed. Right? So this, this thing that I'm holding in my hands is not a piece of bread anymore. It is only the body and blood of Christ. Right? That's transubstantiation. The bread undergoes a change in its substance. Same thing with the wine. What does the Bible actually say? Right? The Bible actually says that there are four things that go into your mouth. Bread, the body of Christ. Wine, the blood of Christ. These are the four things that the Bible actually talks about. This is why when we Lutherans say that the the bread is the body, the, the wine is the blood of Christ. We often use words like, in, with, and under the bread, Christ gives us his body uh, to eat. And in, with, and under the wine, Christ gives us his blood to eat and to drink. Right? The idea is, the bread doesn't stop being bread, but it becomes the body of Christ. So when you eat it, you're eating the bread, which is the body of Christ. And when you drink the wine, you are drinking the wine, which is the blood of Christ. How does this happen? You don't really need to know that. You just need to know what the Word of God says. Any attempt to expl explain this in a way that makes sense to human reason is speculation. It's speculation. So Luther dismisses the idea of transubstantiation by saying that it's mere, it, it, it's, it's merely sophisticated trickery. All right? He says, as for transubstantiation, we care nothing about the sophistic cunning by which they teach that bread and wine leave or lose their own natural substance
substance so that only the appearance and color of bread remain and not the true bread. For it is in perfect agreement with Holy Scriptures that there is and remains bread, as Paul himself calls it, the bread which we break. Let a person so eat of that bread. All right, so Paul is referring to the bread that has already been consecrated. Let a person eat of this bread and drink of this cup in a worthy manner, right? He that eateth and drinketh this bread and this cup unworthily is guilty of the what? Body and blood of the Lord. So you have four things in the sacrament. Bread, body, wine, blood. How does this happen? By the will and gift and grace of God. And it happens just the way he wants it to happen. Yours, it is, it is for you to believe this and enjoy it. Not to try to figure it out. Okay? All right. So that's the uh, sacrament of the altar. Now we come to the keys, the keys, the authority to bind sins and not forgive them or to loose sins by forgiving them is an office and power entrusted by Christ to his church, not just to the Pope and papal hierarchy. All right. The keys are an office and power given by Christ to the church for the binding and loosing of sins. All right, now where is this written? All right, in, in Matthew chapter, you don't have to turn there, but in Matthew chapter 16 and in verse 19, it says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right? So that's why I call it the, the keys. The church has the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What do the keys do? They open the doors of heaven for sinners, and they lock the doors of heaven for impenitent people. All right? This is the office of the keys. The church has the authority to forgive sins, and the church has the authority to bind sins or retain sins when people are impenitent. Right? Now, in, uh, in John's Gospel, which we've been paying a lot of attention to in, uh, in, in recent months, uh, in John chapter 20, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples on Easter evening, and he says, Whosoever sins ye remit, or forgive, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So, when a, when a sinner is penitent, that is when they are sorry for their sins, and want to be forgiven, and want to amend their sinful life, the church has the authority from Jesus to proclaim the forgiveness of sins to them, to forgive their sins, right? And when a person is living in outward manifest sin, and they will not repent of their sin, but insist that what God's word says is evil, they say is good. When people are living like that, they are impenitent. And therefore, they are not to, they are not to dream that God forgives them because they, by their own impenitence, they make it impossible for the forgiveness to flow to them, right? So the impenitent have their sins retained. 
they have their sins retained, that is, held on to them. So that they, you know, I said a few weeks ago in church that, you know, sin doesn't wear off. You know, like you might have uh, dirt on your, on your hands from working on your car. But if you get busy working in the garden or doing something else, eventually all that greasy dirt from working on your car wears off. You know, uh, sin doesn't wear off. Never. The only thing that happens with sin is it sticks to you until it sticks to you on the day of judgment or it is freely forgiven and sent away by Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. That's the only thing that deals with sin is faith in the forgiveness of sins for Jesus Christ's sake. This is, this is a wonderful treasure. So when a person, when a person insists on living in their sin and they insist on rejecting the, the forgiveness of sins by holding on to their sins instead of repenting of it, they have their sins retained by the church. That is that God has not forgiven their sins and will surely visit their iniquity upon them unless they come to repentance. All right, so that's the office of the keys. It says this implies, this applies not only to gross and well-known sins, but also the subtle hidden sins that are known only to God. As it is written, who can discern his errors? And St. Paul himself complains that with my flesh I serve the law of sin. It is not in our power to judge which, how great and how many, uh, the sins are. This belongs to God alone. As it is written, enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. And Paul says, I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby just, I am not thereby acquitted. All right, what's, what's, what's uh, Luther saying here? He's saying, listen, remember how it, when we were studying the papacy together, you had to remember and confess every sin and only the sins that you remembered and confessed were covered by absolution. That's the Roman Catholic idea. Here, Luther is saying this. When you confess your sins, you confess that you are guilty of all kinds of sins you're not even aware of because the Bible teaches us Number one, who can discern his errors? The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Right? So therefore, we cannot trust in ourselves that we actually realize half the things that we do that are sinful. So what do we do? We admit that we're sinners in every way, shape, and form. I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what I have done and by what I have left undone. We Lutherans, that's the way we talk all the time. Why? Because we know that we are only dimly aware of how sim sinful we are. And even when we really try hard, there are things that are sins that we don't recognize as sins and therefore we don't confess them. Right? So we plead that God would cover us completely with his grace, wipe away all of our sins because Christ has once and for all paid the full price for your full redemption. This is a wonderful treasure. The forgiveness of sins is so powerful that it transcends the numerical uh, listing of sins. It is not in our power to judge which and how great and how many our sins are. This belongs to God alone. Right? Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. So that's where we will end it today with, uh, with the office of the keys and the idea here that the forgiveness of sins 
is for those who are sorry for their sins, those who are impenitent and unbelieving, because you cannot be believing and be impenitent, right? They mutually exclude one another. So when a person is impenitent and they insist that their sin is not a sin, and they insist that uh, they want to continue in their sin, such a person is not a Christian, right? No matter how they might say that they like Jesus or whatever it is that they say, they don't. Because if they love Jesus, they would do what he says. They would acknowledge that what he says is right and what they think that is in opposition to that is wrong. All right, that's where we ended today. Let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, we are getting closer and closer to the end of the small coal articles.